We absolutely have community spread in this country. That's the problem of a highly leveraged economy, is that if you are late, you risk making a policy mistake. I feel good about where we're going as an economy here. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. Goldman cut its forecast for U.S. growth, warning about the Omicron variant, while Treasury yields trim Friday's plunge. Crypto crumbles, Bitcoin, and other digital tokens plunge over the weekend, another indication of the risk aversion sweeping across markets. And stay with Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. This hour, we speak to property grandee Leon Bressler for a wide-ranging conversation on real estate and much more. You can send in your questions on IBM. Plus TV Go, or you can tweet me at Flacqua. But first thing is first, uh, like every day at 9.02 London time, we look at the markets and the focus is firmly on some of the asset classes that are moving the most. Uh, European stocks actually gaining some uh, seven tenths of eight percent. The focus in, in terms of some of the industry groups that are moving the most is, for example, energy, the biggest gainer, gaining some 1.5 percent. And the focus is also on the U.S. 10 year yield. Now, we touched 130 on Friday, and there wasn't that much movement after we had the U.S. jobs report. The focus now now, not only on inflation, but some of the indications that the Fed could do next. I hear more and more uh, banks not having to, uh, you know, trim by that much GDP growth forecasts like Goldman Sachs did, but still it's having an impact on some of the equity stocks. And then how they position this 180 degree turn by Jay Powell will be very interesting. Bitcoin, it was quite a volatile um, weekend. That's probably the understatement of the hour. It's now currently at 48,312. You can see in terms of gains, it's pretty much the same across the board, almost a 1% gain for the FTSE, the DAX, and the FTSE MIB, just a little bit of the lagging, I guess, in the CAC 40, seven-tenths of a percent higher. Now, initial data from South Africa, the epicenter of the outbreak of the Omicron variant, don't appear to show a surge in hospitalization. The U.S. Chief Medical Advisor Anthony Fauci says... It does not look like there's a great degree of severity so far, but also cautions it's too early to be certain. We absolutely have community spread in this country. We have community spread with the New York-Minnesota case where someone was in Minnesota, went to a conference in New York, got infected, and people with whom he had contact with also got infected. We don't know how many of them, but there's no doubt that there's community spread. Well, we're now joined by Peter Fitzgerald, Viva Investment Chief Investment Officer for Multi-Asset and Macro. And we're also joined by Sam Fazeli for an update on the virus. He's from Bloomberg Intelligence. Sam, first of all, what do we know about the variant and when will we find out more? Is it more deadly? Is it more spreadable? And when do we, you know, when can we really assess what kind of risk we have going forwards? Yeah, I think the uh, the timing for this, Francine, is going to be another week or two. We've got a really good article on the uh, Bloomberg Terminal right now that actually discusses that. Um, the cases have risen so fast that it has. We have to wait still for hospitalizations, which which can happen within a week or two after the case rises, to catch up. Um, hopefully, it will remain uh, of what, exactly what you've been saying. That is uh, really not causing a major rise. But if infection rates are much much higher, you'd still have the same uh, potential risk of overwhelming the health system. So, uh, Peter, what does that mean for markets? First of all, d d is it automatic that this is inflationary because it will hit supply chains, even if it's, you know, even if we're lacking of information because of zero, zero COVID tolerance in certain countries, it's going to be much harder to get goods in and out? So, so I think that, that, that depends to, to some extent on the data that's going to come out over the next week or so in terms of the ability of this virus to spread. Um, and as the previous uh, speaker mentioned, that, that, that is the key in, in terms of what is the amount of natural immunity that has developed in, in the community, both in the form of prior infection and in form of the vaccines that are available. But I think irrespective of, of, of this uh, new uh, mutation, there is clearly um, uh, an upside risk to inflation. This, this doesn't really change that materially. It just provides, I think, more, more uncertainty. Um, what kind of uncertainty, Sam, does, does it mean in terms of vaccine distributions and booster shots? Um, well, I mean, it, it, what, what we have to consider here is uh, to, to get the information on how, how well the vaccines are protecting against severe disease. And, of course, 
there's a large number of booster doses being uh, uh, delivered across European and, and US countries. And unfortunately, that vaccine inequity issue with emerging markets is still something that is, um, that is uh, raising its ugly head. So that, that's something we have to wait and see. But Francine, what I'm worried about is political reaction to rapidly rising cases and what that means for social distancing and work from home mandates, which all have impacts on our economy. Yeah, Peter, and of course, you know, the impact on the economy, I don't know whether there are other parts of the world that you're a lot more cautious. I know you also have a cautious view in understanding what this new variant means, but are there parts of the world where, for example, equities look expensive? I know we'll show in a moment a great chart looking at, for example, European equities at a record discount compared to U.S. ones. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the, the challenge with looking at, at U.S. versus European equities is you have to adjust for the huge sector disparities between the two indices where, uh, as we all know, the U.S. is made up now um, well over 25 percent of, of that index is tech, whereas Europe has a much, <clears throat> sorry, a much smaller weighting in technology. So so really, really a U.S.-European discount is, is effectively a technology story. And, and I think there are, there are quite clearly some areas of the market where valuations are stretched. Um, that is not in all of tech, but in some, in some of those tech names. Um, and, and obviously you were speaking earlier about um, Bitcoin, uh, crypto and all of that um, universe, if you like, where, where earnings uh, are simply don't, don't exist yeah. for a large extent. Um, so so the, yeah. I think we, it needs to be quite nuanced. Um, and Peter, yeah, we're seeing this great chart. Thank you, Daniel Curtis, for sending it my way, looking at the European stocks and some other valuations. We need to thank Sam Fazelli from Bloomberg Intelligence. But Peter, stay with me because we're just getting also some breaking news on Evergrande, uh, planning to include some of the offshore bonds in restructuring. And it's very clear that it's one of the first times that we have an acknowledgement also from China that, you know, some of the plan would include public and private notes. This is according to people familiar with the matter. And the developer has issued this brief filing on the restructuring plan on Friday. How do you deal with China right now? And could there be a, a spillover effect, Peter, to other parts of, you know, in China or equities? Or because it's been flagged so much, you don't see it as anything that would be worrisome yeah, for investors? I, I think that that's the point. This has been so well flagged. And I think any investors that are still holding those bonds, you know, they're priced for a restructuring. Uh, I don't. I don't think that's that's a particular surprise. To 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 be quite honest, I think there are, there are bigger challenges more broadly in in China in terms of zero COVID policy, curtailing growth, and having that impact on supply chains, as as, as you spoke about earlier. But I, I I don't think bringing Evergrande bonds into a potential restructuring should be seen as anything negative. It's completely expected. Um, Peter, I have this great chart, again, that our, you know, Tsar of Charts is putting up for us, looking at the Chinese yeah. junk bond index. Is there anything that you like in China right now? And I guess one of the key points that you were trying to do is that, or to say, is that, you know, if you expect real rates to remain negative, wh what does that mean for equities overall? Yeah, so, so with, within China, you know, we, we are long Chinese government bonds, and, and, and our view there is it will be um, unlikely that you would see interest rate rise it rise in China while you're going through this restructuring within the property sector and the large deflationary impact that that can have um, within the economy. So, so within China, we 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 are investors into into their own uh, sovereign bonds, particularly in the offshore uh, five-year point where yields are about two and a half percent, and that's relatively attractive compared mm -hmm. to most other government bond markets. Um, and, and regarding your point on, on negative real rates, I, I think this, this, is, this is one of the key themes that we've had this year. It will remain a key theme next year, that, that the biggest risk to equities is um, real rates moving back into positive territory. And that's a risk. It's not our, it's not our central view. And, and as long as real rates remain negative, it is going to provide quite a tailwind more broadly behind risk assets and, and equities. All right, Peter, thank you so much. Peter Fitzgerald there from Aviva Investors stays with us. Now, Smart Conversations continue on Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. This hour, we speak to property grandee Leon Bressler for a wide-ranging conversation on real estate and much more. Up next, though, we discuss the latest U.S. job numbers with Peter Fitzgerald from Aviva Investors. Send in your questions on IB Plus TV Go. This is Bloomberg.
overall a strong report. Much, much better than the headline would suggest. It's a good report across the board. The headline number was a bit softer than we were expecting. Jobs growth was disappointing. A lot of that looks like seasonality and the impact of seasonal flows. It's exactly the kind of report that the Fed actually wants to see. There's no ambiguity. I mean, the Fed has a window to move, and, uh, and obviously they can take advantage of it. They have to start moving. They have to move. Our base case is for the first hike in, in June, but the risks are, are certainly tilting towards earlier. They have to make up that lost ground, and maybe that means faster hiking rates. If you go faster than you normally want to go, you risk breaking something. The Fed now is looking at raising rates into a decelerating growth backdrop. We think they're going to have an awfully hard time doing that. The Fed is going to have to be very smart, both in what it says in its communication and is in policy implementation. Some of our guests there reacting to Friday's jobs report and job growth posted its smallest gain this year, while the unemployment rate fell by more than forecast to 4.2%, offering a mixed picture. Now, the labor market could be hit further if the Omicron variant leads to new restrictions. Now, over the weekend, Goldman Sachs also cut their forecast for the U.S. economy this year and next over the spread of Omicron. We're back with Peter Fitzgerald from Aviva Investors. Peter, where do you see value in the U.S. right now? Yeah, where do we see value in the U.S.? Yeah, I, I mean, there, there are <laughs> that little a number, question. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, so so for for us, it's it's still it's still equities, as as difficult as that may seem to to some people, given the the significant rally that that we've seen, and and the the, the way that I, I I frame this is really really quite simply, um, you know, we're still running, or all of the Fed is still running, what I call emergency interest rate policies and emergency monetary policies in the U.S. And I think quite simply, we're no longer in an emergency. We're not in a great situation. I think the economy is doing is doing well. The jobs report didn't throw up any major surprises. Um, it, were it not for this new variant and the uncertainty that that creates, and that uncertainty is actually exacerbated and I would say augmented in markets as you head into, into year end and people wanted to close out their positions. Um, I, I, think, I think things are looking okay for the US and Ultimately, some of those large tech companies, they, they actually don't have any global competition. So if you look at the likes of, of Microsoft, I mean, who, who is their competition? I mean, that's a very good question. But do you see, I don't know whether it's regulation or something, you know, coming up. How difficult is it to look at some of these big giants and say they'll remain the same in three, four years? I think it's 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 difficult, but what we always do in markets is we continuously look for huge fundamental changes, and then ultimately markets remain consistent and and follow trends for quite quite a lot longer than than most people expect. I think the risk to some of those businesses, and again, not our central case, is that the Fed raises rates more aggressively than markets are currently pricing. And, and that's not two or three rate rises next year. I don't think that would be enough to upset markets materially. It would be if, if you went on a, a more prolonged and more aggressive hiking cycle, which started, let's say, in March or April next year, I think that could, could create some, some nervousness, particularly if we were to push real rates back into, into positive territory. Um, Peter, I might pivot back to Europe because we're just hearing yeah. from German Chancellor, Mr. Schultz, confirming that Karl Lauterbach is going to be a German health minister. And one of the questions also that we had for Pascal Donahue, who we interviewed a short while ago on the Eurogroup, is actually what are we expecting from this German government? Are we expecting banking union? Will they deal with Brexit differently? Like, could it be a game changer, uh, Peter, for what you like on, on a market perspective or not so much? Yeah, so, so I, I think we're probably, you know, following it less less closely. I think where where you are seeing um, quite a, a a pivot within Europe and within Germany is in towards um, the importance of climate and green investment, and I think that's a theme that that will continue. It will have some unintended consequences at times. So an, a, an example of that is uh, as you provide, uh, I would say disincentives for the asset management industry to invest into oil and gas names and for banks to finance them. You're actually seeing a, a dearth of new oil exploration, which is actually leading to oil prices moving um, quite aggressively higher. Um, you, you also see opportunities in European markets in areas such as carbon credits. 
So carbon credits in Europe are priced at $80 today. They're up over 120% year to date. Um, th these are other assets that are going to be impacted by the changes in, in Germany. And in fact, you know, the German, the, the incoming German government announced uh, recently that they're looking to put a floor yeah. on carbon prices at 60, 60 euros mm -hmm. a ton in Europe. So th these policies will have will have an impact, but maybe not in the in the traditional areas that people would have expected. All right. Thank you so much, Peter Fitzgerald there, Aviva Investments Chief Investment Officer for Multi-Asset and Macro, joining us on some of his calls today. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg. First word news, here's Max Ramsey. Hi, Max. Hi, Francine. Saudi Arabia has raised oil prices for buyers in Asia and the U.S., signaling it sees demand staying strong despite the spread of the Omicron virus variant. The, moves, the move comes just days after OPEC and its allies surprised traders with a decision to boost crude output. Saudi Aramco increased January January's prices for all crude grades to the highest price since February 2020, before the pandemic took hold. France's Republicans have nominated their first woman presidential candidate as the challenger to Emmanuel Macron in next April's election. Valérie Pécresse won the final round of the Conservative Party ballot with 61% of members' votes. Currently leader of the Paris region, she was seen as the more moderate of the two candidates. The U.S. is reported to be planning to declare a diplomatic boycott of the Beijing Winter Olympics, this according to CNN. The decision not to send any U.S. officials to the Games in February will be announced this week. The move would be largely symbolic, though, as few U.S. officials are likely to visit China anyway due to strict COVID quarantine rules. And a court in Myanmar has sentenced former leader Aung San Suu Kyi to four years in prison, according to reports from the AFP news agency. Suu Kyi, who was removed in a coup in February, was found guilty of inciting dissent against the military and breaching COVID rules. Suu Kyi's party won more than 80% of seats in Myanmar's election one year ago. Global news, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Max Ramsey. This is Bloomberg Francine. Max, thank you so much. Now, coming up, Bitcoin crashes over the weekend before recouping some of the losses. Past price movements indicate there could be more pain to come. We'll talk crypto next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, Bitcoin crashed more than 20% over the weekend before leveling off just below $50,000. The cryptocurrency seems to be following a similar profile to its price swings in April, which could see it land significantly lower than where it currently stands. Well, joining us now to discuss all of this is Eddie van der Waalt from our MLive team. Eddie, what is going on with cryptocurrency? You know what? I think crypto got a little bit of a bailout earlier this year with the launch of the US ETF, right? Everybody was excited about that. We knew it was coming at some point. We didn't know exactly when. But, you know, that was a reason to stay bullish. And by the dip that we saw at the, you know, at, back in April, as you point out. But I think that negative sentiment in, in, in cryptocurrencies, uh, that, that those cycles tend to last a little bit longer. They tend to last until we see the next halving cycle. So I think, you know, that might be what, what is playing out here. And in, in which case, you know, we could be in for another couple of years of this sort of range trading with a downward bias in cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin really, you know, underperforming rivals like Ether, Eddie, is that something that will continue? Absolutely. And does it mean that there'll be shifts actually from Bitcoin into Ether and others? Such a good point, Francine. I, you know what? Uh, Ether has been absolutely phenomenal this past year. And yes, I think the, the use case for Ether is easier to understand for the broad finance market. So it's easier for somebody who, you know, who likes um, options, contracts and so on to get behind that because this is something that you can do on Ether. You can make smart contracts, you can do all sorts of clever things that you really just can't at this moment in time in Bitcoin. However, if we see you know, a multi-month drawdown in Bitcoin, it's very hard for the other cryptocurrencies to uh, sustain their momentum. They are still very much derivatives of Bitcoin in that sense. So Ether, Ether very dependent on Bitcoin, I think. Yeah, at the same time, El Salvador buying the dip. I mean, it, it is actually pretty amazing that you have tweets from the president saying how much they bought at what price. And this is the tweet that we had um, on December 4th. I mean, are they, how much are they propping up the market? 
Well, that's that. You know, it's it's hard to say. It's hard to say exactly how much impact El Salvador has, but certainly in sentiment terms, it helps an awful lot because you know this has been a publicity coup for the Bitcoin community. And lower down in that thread, of course, he's picking a fight with Peter Schiff, um, the 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 old gold bug, and uh, you know it's just absolutely fantastic reading that over the weekend. It is a bit of you know. If it was my country's monetary policy, uh, or rather reserve management that was being effectively day traded, I would be very worried. But, you know, the Bitcoin community loves it. They certainly do. Eddie, thank you so much. Uh, Eddie van der Velt there from our M live team and a little bit of a crypto expert. Now, coming up, we'll be speaking exclusively with Leon Bressler, the chairman of mall operator Unibai Rodamco Westfield and founder of Aramont Capital, owner of the famous Pinewood Studios. Well, send in your questions on IB Plus TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Goldman cutting its forecast for U.S. growth, warning about the Omicron variant. Treasury yields trim Friday's plunge. Crypto crumbles, Bitcoin and other digital tokens plunge over the weekend, another indication of the risk aversion sweeping across markets. And stay with Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Up next, we speak to a property grandee, Leon Bressler, for a wide-ranging conversation on real estate and much more. You can also send in your questions on IB+. Plus. TV go. Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Monday. It's going to be a busy week. Uh, welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. So first thing is first, as we always do, every half an hour, we check the markets. And there's actually quite a lot to talk about today because the main pressure points are still inflation. We look at the Evergrande debt and exactly try and understand what China plans to do around that. Then there's a flattening yield curve in the U.S. Look out for any hints from what Jay Powell will and won't do. A lot of banks thinking that there was a 180 degree reversal from his expectations in terms of inflation. European stocks, U.S. futures, though, pushing higher. If you look at what investors want to know is, of course, the impact of the Omicron variant, the regulatory outlook for Chinese technology companies, and bets on monetary policy easing. You can see Bitcoin, 48,171. Now, retail brick-and-mortar real estate has taken a big hit during the pandemic. Shopping mall giant Unibail Rodamco Westfield has responded with an aggressive deleveraging drive. The group has scrapped its dividends until 2023. Well, we're delighted to be joined by Leon Bressler. He's founder and managing partner at Hermont, owner of the famous Pinewood Studios here in the UK, chairman also of Nibai Rodamco Westfield, which operates a Westfield mall chain. Leon Bressler, as always, thank you so much for joining us. And I think for the first time we can do it in studio. So Correct. Thank you very much. Not everything is bad in terms of the variant or how bad it's getting at the moment. First of all, give me a sense of what Omicron does to U.S. shopping malls. Are people staying out? If you look at some of the data in terms of footfall, how do you expect it to plan to play out? I think the malls are back. You know, in fact, I was in Westfield Garden State Plaza in New Jersey on Black Friday, and uh, the crowd was there. And I think more importantly, I would say that the central position of malls in the American culture is still intact. And you could see that with a mix of people in that shopping mall, and particularly groups of teenagers. So the malls remain very much part of the U.S. culture. And in fact, people are back. We see that sales today are higher, slightly higher than they were in 2019 in the U.S. and only slightly lower in continental Europe. So you, I really believe in, in the return of the malls. Uh, to return the mall even shorter term, do you think Omicron will, will change any of the dynamics going on to Christmas or not? It's clear that, you know, every wave is not a, a good sign. A variant uh, about which we don't know anything yet is not a good sign. But, you know, we, we are absolutely confident that, you know, the pandemic will be behind us sometime, perhaps in the spring, and the rebound will be even stronger then. If you uh, give me a sense of what investors are looking at, I know we've seen a couple of deals between the UK and US malls. Are we going to see you know, more of these deals? Like, how is the market for m a in general? Oh, we, we see that, you know, when I talk about the return of the malls, it's not a personal subjective judgment, you know. Uh, for the US, for example, you had a, 
a, a note by uh, Green Street Advisors last week, and they are the most uh, reputable independent research firm, and they were lowering the cap rates uh, for AMOLs, and uh, that reflects a substantial increase in value. So we see that. We see also that a number of transactions have been announced or pre-announced uh, in Europe. Uh, we see that in the UK, in Denmark, in France, and you know it clearly indicates that we have hit the bottom, mm -hmm. and that uh, the issue is you know how strong, how quick the rebound will be. Uh, Mr. Brasler, I want to talk about valuations, but actually I did a bit of research thanks to Dan Curtis, who does all the charts for us, and this is what we found when it comes to the real estate sector. So it's one of the most richly valued sectors in the S&P 500, about 47 um, based you know, earnings per share estimates for the next 12 months. And if you look at you know, what this graphic shows us, it's rebounded well above pre-pandemic levels. How, you know, how do you see this evolving? Are, are valuations correct at the moment, or will they you know, have to readjust? I wouldn't judge the, the, the valuations, but it's clear that uh, potential inflation, we don't know exactly how much and how long inflation uh, will be, but clearly inflation is also back to a certain level, and it's clear that it means that there will be more flows of capital to real assets, uh, real estate, infrastructure, farmland, and others. Uh, I would say that the uh, malls are the lagging uh, sector okay. in that rebound, uh, which is why the uh, Green Street Advisors note is interesting, simply because the malls were not uh, the flavor of the day. And, you know, I think that we will see a revaluation of relative. Mm -hmm. Uh, valuations between asset classes, and I believe that uh, malls will be the big winners for 2022. What will happen to retail rents? So rental. You know, uh, rents have adjusted. Uh, you know, uh, what we have today is a new equilibrium. Uh, E-commerce is there to stay. Physical retail is there to stay. And what we see today is the success of the omni-channel model, which means that the best, uh, the most important, most influential brands are playing that game. And we see that concretely. Let me give you only two or three examples. You know, in Westfield Les Quatre Temps, in Paris, La Défense, uh, Zara has just opened its largest store in France, and uh, it's an incredible success. Uh, if we look at Westfield London, not far from here, uh, if we look at Westfield London, uh, we know that Nike and Apple are set to substantially increase their uh, source. So is, is it difficult to actually increase rental prices where we're still dealing with the pandemic? No, there are no increases today, let's be realistic okay. and honest. Uh, but you know, what we see is a stabilization or relative stabilization. And that's the important point. You know, once you know that you have hit the bottom, you know that there will be a rebound. Um, talk to me a, a little bit about your net zero carbon target. So how much will it cost to refit, for example, some of your properties to become more carbon neutral? Uh, you know, I think that as far as we are concerned, as far as uh, Uni by Rodemco Westfield is concerned, our malls are quite new, you know. If you look you know, here in London, Westfield Stratford, Westfield London are very new. And we have done a lot of work over the years, you know, whether it is in Europe, in the UK or in the US. So there will be expenses. Uh, but, you know, I don't think that it is a, a fundamental issue. Uh, the more fundamental issue was, was physical retail there to stay. And now we have the answer, and it's clearly yes. And do, are you expecting to do some disposals, you know, in the coming... We, we have done that. As we have said, you know, we wanted to reduce our level of debt, and we have done a number of disposals in Europe. No. Uh, and, and we'll continue to do so while maintaining our position as the leader uh, in continental Europe and the UK. In the US, as you know, we have a strategy to uh, reduce radically, drastically our uh, financial exposure to the US, and we'll do that probably when the market conditions are good. Um, so you're a firm believer that, that malls are back, I guess, as a shopping experience, and you also mentioned some of the, uh, I guess, the younger population that go and hang out in malls. What needs to happen for people to feel safe if the pandemic drags on? Is there anything that you can do in terms of ventilation, in terms of making them bigger so that oh, more we, people do mask wearing? We, we have done that. We, we have done that because, you know, we are operating under strict restrictions everywhere. So we have done that. And in fact, we are doing even more because, you know, more than one million people have been vaccinated in our malls. 
uh, whether it is in Europe, in the UK, or the US, one, more than one million, and we will continue to open vaccination centers. So we are very sensitive to that. You know, obviously it's a difficult situation for each and every person, family, household. Uh, difficult for retailers and, and for uh, landlords, uh, but you know we are optimistic. You know people adjust. You know, and every pandemic has ended in history, either a medical end or what we call a social end when it is integrated into our societies. I mean, I remember hanging out in the mall in the U.S. mall in my teenage years was, was a long time ago. How have they changed? Is it now much more about experience? For example, also with food, is it like a, a major f food hall when you look at, you know, how they're actually put in place? I think it's. Everything for the top malls. I think that the marginal malls are disappearing and will continue to vanish, uh, which means that there will be even more concentration of the top malls. But as you know, that has been the strategy of Unibuy Rodemco Westfield forever. We have the top malls in Europe, from uh, the Mall of Scandinavia in Stockholm to Maquinista in Barcelona. We have the top two malls in the UK west and east of, of London, and we have top malls in the U.S., you know, from Garden State Plaza in New Jersey to Westfield Century City in Beverly Hills. Mm -hmm. So I think those, those centers will prosper uh, because A, they will survive, and B, they will thrive because of the experience they provide. What's next for Lyon Bresler? Is there anything that you want to, you know, sell off or buy? I know there, there was a, you know, a pretty big fight surrounding Unibuy, which you came on often to talk about. Is there anything else that you see as you wanting to get involved in? No, I, as far as Unibuy Rodemco is concerned, for the next 18 months, you know, it's more of the same, you know. But what we are doing also is to invest more in our malls in terms of knowing our customers, bringing more to the customers and to the retailers, and therefore being a full team member of this uh, multi-channel strategy. And that will uh, really change the landscape dramatically and generate also ancillary income for the, the company. Do, do you have any exposure in China? No, we are Nothing. purely Europe, UK, and the US. So, Mr. Bressler, thank you so much for joining us. Leon Bressler, founder and managing partner at Hermont and chairman of Unibuy Rodamco Westfield. We're just getting some breaking news on China, which is why I was asking Mr. Bressler if he had any exposure. Uh, the China Politburo is studying its 2022 economic work. Again, one of the biggest risks to the world economy and therefore the markets is the decrease of growth that China could see over the next decade, starting with next year. That has huge, huge implications, not only for the bond market, but also some of the equity. Now, coming up, we'll have plenty more on the markets. We'll be talking environmental, social, and governance issues with Yuko Takano, Portfolio Manager for Sustainable and Thematic Strategy at Newton Investment Management. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. Finance politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, this year's COP26 summit has succeeded in making environmental issues a key priority for central governments and investors. That's the conclusion of my next guest. We're joined by Yuko Takano, Portfolio Manager for Sustainable and Thematic Strategies at Newton Investment Management. Yuko, a real pleasure for me to have you, especially in the studio, but to also talk about investment in sustainable space, which has really increased in the last couple of you know months and years. Yeah. How do you make sure you're not greenwashing. I mean, this is probably the, the question that you get the most from some of the, the people that invest in your portfolios. Yes, you're completely right. Um, we get those questions from uh, our investors a lot. Um, we have gone through a meticulous proprietary process in-house where we make sure that um, all the appropriate KPIs are in place so that we are you know, not doing greenwashing and that there's um, kind of proper targets that are set. Uh, and we monitor our companies quite rigorously through engagement so that that doesn't happen. And so, you know, how much more engagement are we going to see from a, a lot of the investors with the ESG space in the next 12 months? Well, I, I don't know whether it's difficult to put a number on it. Will mm -hmm. it, you know, increase fourfold or less? Um, yeah, you're right. It's uh, very difficult to put a number on it. Um, but I think that the um, quantity of engagements, of course, is going to increase, but also the quality. And this is, I think, a really big area where active managers can make a big difference because we can actually you know, talk to the people who are working at these companies to try to kind of dig down through the data and uh, you know, kind of find the truth, if you like. So we do think that this is a big opportunity for us. I mean, is there a space that actually you see much more action or much more appetite from investors? I don't 
don't know whether it's biodiversity. We haven't really talked, mm. you know, about water maybe as much as some of the other things. Yeah, well, um, I think COP26 was uh, interesting in the sense that I think the knowledge level of both investors but also the general public has really increased over the past couple of years. And you kind of saw that with COP26 where, you know, people are now talking about biodiversity. People are talking about water scarcity. Um, and that wasn't really happening a couple of years ago pre-COVID. So I do think that the overall knowledge level has really come up. Um, we as investors need to be kind of one step ahead of the game, if you like. So we are actually, uh, because the valuation levels of those companies have gone up quite significantly, we're actually focused on other parts of the market, things like precision agriculture and um, you know interesting companies in the food innovation chain. I mean, can you give us a flavor of some of the companies that you're looking at? And yeah. is there going to be a shift when you look at ESG? Will the shift go on to E? Um, I think that um, within ESG, it's interesting. E has always kind of been this like, um, underlying theme, if you like. Um, last year, I think with COVID, a lot of the um, issues around social uh -huh. supply chain and treatment of um, labor was, you know, really kind of came to light. But I think he has always kind of been <laughs> been there, and especially this year, it's really been accelerated um, because of the headlines and because of COP26. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think this will be a continuing, ongoing trend. Is it mainly investors from which part of the world that are most interested in ESG? Um, I think um, European investors have always been very <laughs> forward thinking, yeah. but nowadays I talk to my U.S. clients and it's amazing how much they have caught up over the past three years. I mean, three years ago we would kind of bring the concept of EHG and they would just kind of say, well, you know, but does that generate returns? Uh, whereas now they're very fully aware that this form of investing really, uh, you know, helps in generating better returns. And so their awareness level has gone up very significantly. Um, you go, when you look at the next 12 months, what will be your most challenging? I mean, is it to actually try and, and look at the companies that will give you returns whilst going through this transition? Mm. Or is it, you know, fielding yes. regulation? Yes. Um, I think um, all of the above, I think, is the right answer. Um, I also think that macro factors like, um, you know, rising interest rates um, and inflation will have an impact on short-term um, share prices. And kind of navigating that volatility would probably be our biggest challenge over the next 12 months. It, it has regulation. I know the, the European Union has kind of been leading, you know, and spearheading some of the efforts when it yes. comes to sustainability, but they've also taken away labels of ESG in certain parts of, the, of, of I guess, the market. Mm -hmm. I mean, how difficult is it to be, you know, out front on this? Um, I do think that it takes uh, quite a bit of institutional power, if you like, to be yeah. really on top of these types of things. Um, I think, you know, maybe going back three, four years ago, you could probably start an ESG fund with yourself and a dog. Now, I know that that's exaggerating a little bit, but now you really need, uh, you know, formidable, responsible investment team. You really need um, a good stewardship team and so on and so forth. So you really need that backing, that team behind you as an investor to make it all happen. I mean, will that actually space change to a point where asset managers will, will you know, won't have a specialist on sustainability because that will be permeated mm. through all portfolios? I think so. Um, I, I definitely think that's the direction that we're going. I mean, look, the way that uh, Newton and, you know, myself, the way we see ESG is that it's just another form of sensible investing. And I think as there's more regulation coming in, as the EU taxonomy is really implemented and there's more disclosure from the companies, that's only going to get better for investors because there'll be more data available. Yuko, thank you so much for joining us. Yuko Takano there, Portfolio Manager for Sustainable and Thematic Strategies at Newton Investment Management. Now, coming up, U.S. and Russia's top diplomats have a testy exchange over Ukraine as Putin builds up troops on the country's border. That story is up next, and this is Bloomberg. Finance politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, the U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov had had a testy exchange over Ukraine at a dinner with dozens of colleagues. The verbal tension erupted as the U.S. and its European allies seek ways to counter the threat of Russian invasion of Ukraine as President Putin builds up troops on the country's border. Well, joining us now is Bloomberg's executive editor for international government, Rosalind Matheson. Ros, great to speak to you as always. What is the latest on the tensions before Putin and Biden speak tomorrow? 
Well, things, as you say, are indeed pretty tense. So Russia has sustained its build-up of troops and military equipment uh, near the Ukrainian border, and there's no sense they're going to be called back any time soon. Uh, the Russian president is leaving them there as a lever, really, as he calls for security guarantees from NATO and the US, which is essentially NATO get out of my periphery uh, around Russia. Uh, there's also a real sense for him, though, that he sees Ukraine as a bigger prize. For him, Ukraine is fundamentally part of Russia and it's unfinished business. So that means the whole thing is particularly volatile. And at the same time, the US and Europe, as we can see, are stepping up their public warnings against going into Ukraine and certainly their private conversations about how to deal with that, how to deter him from going in to stop a war before it begins, because once it did begin, it would be very difficult for the US and for Europe to do anything about it. Uh, the issue is there's not many cards for them to put on the table if that happens. So what you're seeing is a real push here to deter him from doing so, hence the call that he's going to be having tomorrow with the US president. What, what can we actually expect from the meeting, Roz? If, you know, is this a real, could it be a de-escalation to a point where we don't have to worry about it so much or is it, you know, we just don't know? Well, we did say that in April. We saw a build-up at that point of troops on the Ukrainian border and then Vladimir Putin had his summit, his sit-down in Geneva with the US president, which is really what he was after. Um, he wants a sense of recognition from the US that Russia is an influential player on the global stage. Those sorts of things play very well for him at home. Uh, so for him, getting the meeting itself is a victory. And you can imagine that during that call tomorrow, he'll then push the US president to agree to a proper formal sit down again. So perhaps they're hoping that things will repeat themselves this time around. He gets his meeting with the US president and he pulls his troops back away. Um, but you can imagine that for, for Biden also, there's an incentive here not to be pulled into a conflict, having just withdrawn the U.S. troops from Afghanistan. So he will be trying to get the Russian president to stand down and give him an off-ramp um, as a result of this meeting tomorrow. Um, Ross, there's you know, a, a number of pressure points, of course, across the world when it comes to foreign policy. We understand also uh, the U.S. will you know, boycott the Beijing Winter Olympics. How much will that escalate the tensions between the U.S. and China? Well, it's a symbolic thing more than anything else. It was unlikely to be a big presence of U.S. officials there, given China's very stringent COVID restrictions. You can't just sort of just zip in and out of China these days. Um, but equally, China can say, well, the U.S. is taking a hard line and unfair online on us um, because we're hosting these Olympics. And that would play very well for the president at home, for President Xi Jinping. Um, he can say, well, this is how we're being treated um, by the U.S. So there's a domestic imperative for China there. They're, of course, saying that the U.S. was not even invited to attend. Uh, for the U.S., of course, they can say we're standing up to China when it comes to human rights, which is a particular flashpoint for the relationship, but stopping short, of course, of pulling athletes out of the games. Um, but the broader frame in all of this is, of course, those tensions over everything from trade to tech to investment to human rights. So this is just another element of, of those broader tensions. But for this, in, in terms of the Olympics itself, it's probably more a symbolic one than anything else. Roz, thank you, as always, for all of your insights. Roz Matheson there on some of the foreign affairs challenges going forward. Now, Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. This is Bloomberg. We're looking at the new variant now to see what impacts that'll have. But overall, I, I, we feel good. I feel good about where we're going as an economy here. I'd be signaling uh, four rate increases next year with two-sided uncertainty, depending on how the inflation uh, figures uh, work out. That's the problem of a highly leveraged economy, is that if you are late, you risk making a policy mistake. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines. It is 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 6 p.m. in Hong Kong. On this Monday, December the 6th, our top stories today. China's central bank tries to give a liquidity boost to a slowing economy. It's cutting back the amount of cash most banks must hold in reserve. 
Investors weigh the impact of the Omicron variant. Meanwhile, hedge funds were caught offside during last week's market turmoil. And rising tensions over Ukraine erupt. The U.S. Secretary of State and Russia's Foreign Minister get into a heated exchange at a dinner in Sweden. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance, everybody. This is Surveillance Early Edition. And Kaylee, uh, we saw some policy action, some monetary policy action being taken in the early hours US time from the Chinese, but too late for the Asia session. Yeah, and it did not save Asian stocks overnight, Anna. It was a broadly down day, specifically in China and Hong Kong. And the real culprit is Chinese tech stocks. Of course, the Hang Seng Tech Index is the gauge that really holds most Chinese tech companies. It was down 3.3%, actually to a record low and of course following on from the losses we saw in U.S. listed Chinese tech companies on Friday all stemming from Didi announcing it is going to delist from the NICE relist in Hong Kong raises concern that other companies may be forced to do the same thing as China really cracks down on that sector. Of course SoftBank is a big holder of Didi. It has the Vision Fund has bet largely on a number of Chinese companies and it is feeling the pain. That stock was down more than 8 percent in the Japanese session now at its lowest since June of 2020. Of course Anna was talking about the easing we saw from the PBOC with that triple R cut. The bond market was largely betting easing was going to happen because we're seeing yields coming in on the t Chinese tenure to 2.86% down about four basis points and no real bid for that safe haven Japanese yen today. It's weaker against the dollar by a little more than three tenths of 1% trading at 113.24. Now here in the U.S. traders are still trying to digest that jobs report we got on Friday and what the implications are for the normalization of policy and the speed of that from the Federal Reserve. Of course we did see big losses for stocks on Friday here in the states. This morning though futures are in positive territory up about a quarter of a percent on S&P E-minis. We also are retracing some of the movement we saw in the bond market on Friday. The 10 year yield came in 10 basis points on Friday after that jobs report. This morning though we're retracing about half of that up the better part of five basis points to 139 on that yield. The dollar is slightly stronger on the day and then oil is rebounding after six consecutive weeks of losses. Matt, you have the Saudis raising the prices for Asia and the U.S. maybe signaling some confidence in demand and as a result WTI up a little more than two and a half percent trading at 67.96 a barrel, Matt. Yeah, matching almost the prices they were raising above spot. I am shocked by how much treasuries, I'm still shocked by how much treasuries came in on Friday, Kaylee. It was a really incredible drop in yields. Nonetheless, we have rallies um, in U.S. futures. You just showed rallies in uh, European stocks. Not the kind of gains that we saw a little bit earlier, but we're still up two-thirds of 1% in the U.K., two-thirds of 1% in Spain, as well as in Italy. So we have some decent gains here. If you take a look at um, currencies. I think an interesting move today is the pound. It is actually gaining against the dollar. Maybe some investors see a the pound as a little bit of a safe haven investment because this is something that we've seen over the last few sessions um, of turmoil. When everything goes wrong, the pound seems to be getting bid. And I'm not 100% sure why there have been some viewers that wrote in and listeners that wrote into us saying, that traders were covering short positions. We do see the 10-year yield in Germany rising a little bit as well. Right now up uh, just about one and a half basis points to 37.4 to the negative, right? And we are still seeing really uh, surging cases of coronavirus here in Germany. We went into a lockdown for the unvaccinated on Thursday. We're getting a new chancellor on Wednesday. Olaf Scholz will be confirmed and we'll see how his government um, moves on to fight the coronavirus. And then Bitcoin, just an amazing drop over the weekend, down three and a quarter percent. Right now trading at $47,638. This is a really risk associated asset now. And if Bitcoin continues to be weak, that could be a problem for other retail favorites and really for stocks in general, Anna. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of volatility in those assets that had seen such such gains in recent weeks. And you have to think about the wealth effects when you see Bitcoin collapse that much in one day. We'll get further analysis later in the program. Let's have a look at what lies ahead for this week. It could be another busy one. Today, Russia's President Vladimir Putin visits New Delhi, India, for a two-day summit. We're also focused on uh, uh, the potential for uh, Putin and Biden to speak this week. Tomorrow, we'll get a final reading of third-quarter GDP for the euro area.
On Wednesday, as Matt was just referencing, Germany's first new chancellor in 16 years, Olaf Scholz, is set to be sworn in. U.S. President Joe Biden holds a summit for democracy on Thursday. And on Friday, we'll get the big data point of the week. U.S. consumer price index, multi-decade highs expected. What new will we learn about the inflation story at a time when the Fed is in a quiet period and not able to respond? So that'll be an interesting one. Let's get back to another monetary policy angle, and that involves China. China's central bank has cut the amount of cash most banks must hold in reserve, providing a liquidity boost to a slowing economy. Ender Curran, Bloomberg Chief Asia Economics Correspondent, joins me now from Hong Kong. Uh, Ender, really good to speak to you. So this was in some ways anticipated. Some people have been seeing, had, had been expecting to see this. It had even been flagged maybe by Chinese leadership. Other people saying, though, the timing, a little bit of a surprise. What did you make of it? Definitely expected, Anna. It's a 50 basis point cut. It frees up about 190 US dollars that banks can now lend into the economy. It has been signalled by the authorities, especially Premier Li Keqing himself, who at the end of last week spoke about a, you know, a likely reserve ratio requirement cut by the banks. Now, what it doesn't do is it doesn't bring down the cost of borrowing per se, but it is about freeing up money that, that can go into the wider economy. So it's not going to be any kind of a game changer for the slowdown in China, but it does indicate that the authorities now must be feeling a greater sense of urgency to, um, to put some, or at least be seen to be offering support to the economy. We know that the crackdown in the housing sector is having a, a drag on broader activity. Mm -hmm. And of course, we know there's an uh, this, uh, ongoing pressure on the consumption side of things as well. So at the very least, while this triple or cut by the PBRC isn't in and of itself a dramatic easing or sign of stimulus per se, it does indicate that the authorities are growing more concerned about the uh, state of the economy and that they are now willing to intervene. Well, Enda, let's talk more about the housing sector that you just mentioned. Obviously, Evergrande has been a poster child for the crisis in the property sector in China, and we're getting some details this morning on its restructuring plan. What can you tell us? Yeah, so China's biggest property developer, also its most indebted. It has signaled in recent weeks, including at the end of last week, that it will really struggle to make all of the repayments due on its bonds, including dollar bonds for offshore investors. And my colleagues today, or colleagues out here, are reporting that, in fact, there will be a restructuring coming down the line that will include all of Evergrande's offshore dollar bonds. And that is important because it signals that there will be likely you know, haircuts at some point for everybody involved in this Evergrande process. Uh, it also signals that Evergrande will be heading into a, a workout now. This has this that formal process hasn't started yet, but this kind of suggests that it's on the way. We know that the Guangdong authorities are getting more involved as well. Now, what it doesn't indicate is that while well, it doesn't, it, it shows that this isn't going to be an outright bailout, of course, for Evergrande by the Chinese authorities, it does indicate that there is going to be some pain for foreign investors. And that's what that's why the world is following this story. Uh, there's an impact on China's domestic economy, of course, but there's also a question of how it impacts global investors. Yeah. And we're getting a hint of what, of what that pain might be from this story. All right, Enda, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Enda Curran there talking to us about the triple R rate cut. Now to the latest on the Omicron variant, which has reached more than 40 places around the world that we know of. Initial data from South Africa, which is the epicenter of the outbreak, don't appear to show a surge in hospitalizations. President Biden's chief medical advisor, Anthony Fauci, says there doesn't look like a great degree of severity to the variant so far. We absolutely have community spread in this country. We have community spread with the New York, Minnesota case, where someone was in Minnesota, went to a conference in New York, got infected, and people with whom he had contact with also got infected. We don't know how many of them, but there's no doubt that there's community spread. Now, as investors weigh the impact of the Omicron variant, Bloomberg's Danny Berger joins us with a closer look at last week's market turmoil. Danny, how are we set up um, for this week in terms of positioning? Well, we're set up for perhaps another about face if that's indeed what we witnessed last week. It just lends itself to the volatility we're likely to continue to experience in this market. So I have a chart up next to me for our radio listeners. It's the FTC data of both U.S. positioning in not just treasuries, but stocks as well for leverage funds. So this gives an, us an idea of how the setup is, Matt, specifically for hedge funds. And there's this very large dislocation between stock positioning, which at the start of last week was very 
bullish and bond positioning, which was very bearish. Now, both positions would have caught hedge funds offside. So there's likely to have been a big positioning reversal, which goes a long way to explain what we saw last week. So going forward, it's not just Powell that means that investors will have to rethink their positioning. It's Omicron as well. And there's echoes of this in 2018. Again, for our radio listeners, a very similar setup in 2018 when you had long stock uh, short bond positions that had to be flipped as we confronted a Fed that became more hawkish. Danny, talking of being caught on the wrong side of trades, if you're long of going into the weekend on cryptos, particularly on Bitcoin, you, you may be a, a little upset this morning. And I mean, yeah. we went down as low as 42,000 at the weekend off earlier highs of 69,000 not that long ago. Yeah. Uh, what, is, what is the latest on what drove this? What mm. are we watching for? What's the next layer? Yeah, a little upset might be an understatement for some who watch Bitcoin over the weekend dip below 42,000. And in terms of where we are now, Bitcoin continues to fall. And I think that the main focus for Bitcoin and really all of the retail favorites suffered last week, suffered through the weekend. Matt Maley over at Miller Tayback points to the fact that dip buying really struggled last week. So if you're now a Bitcoin investor, you're concerned that this can bounce back. And bouncing back from buying the dip has really been a key pillar of this equity rally, risk market rally over the past year. So if that is starting to fade, it's, of course, another worrying aspect to throw into this market. All right, Danny, thanks very much. Danny Berger there talking to us about positioning for this week after the turmoil we saw last week. Now, speaking of turmoil, U.S.-Russian tensions are on the rise again. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken and Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov are said to have had a testy exchange over Ukraine at a dinner last week. Um, Jack Fitzpatrick joins us now from the Washington, D.C. Bureau to talk more about this. So I guess they were eating together and they got into it. And now Biden has to have a call with Putin. Yes. So uh, both Blinken and Lavrov gave remarks at, at this event. Uh, and essentially what Lavrov reportedly said was that the end of the pro-Putin Yanukovych regime in Ukraine uh, was a coup, in his words. There was a, a back and forth about NATO and Russian complaints about NATO. Uh, obviously, anything that requires these two countries to rehash everything that happened between Russia and Ukraine in 2014 is not uh, a very pleasant uh, sort of foreshadowing of this call that is now supposed to happen uh, at 6 p.m. Moscow time on Tuesday, according to Kremlin officials. Uh, a, a very testy exchange that, that rehashed some things that we knew were, uh, were sensitive issues between the U.S. and Russia. But clearly, this is not a very positive uh, prelude to the, the forthcoming call between the two presidents. So clearly a lot to watch in foreign policy this week, Jack. When it comes to domestic policy, we didn't see a government shutdown over the weekend, so that's a positive. But Congress still has a very long to-do list before they recess uh, for the holidays. What's number one on the agenda this week? Yeah, avoiding a shutdown was one check mark uh, on a few things that they need to do. It looks like the top uh, priority in terms of floor time and trying to get a bill to become law would be the defense authorization bill, the annual bill that they have to do every year. That is getting tripped up by some other issues that uh, particularly some Republican senators want to tie on to that, including restrictions on uh, on, on products made with forced labor with an eye toward uh, the Uyghurs in China. So that's, be, that's proven to be a tough one. Uh, very urgent is the uh, deadline for the debt limit to be raised or suspended. The latest we've heard from the Bipartisan Policy Center, which has done a good job of projecting that, is it could be as early as about December 21st. The way that's going is it may take even a couple weeks for them to process that and, and, and get to that. So we'll probably need to see action on the debt limit very soon. And those two things taking up time have kind of pushed back uh, the ambitions of Democrats to get their tax and spending bill done mm -hmm. this year. That That's probably looking more like January. All right. Could be a 2022 story. Thank you so much to Jack Fitzpatrick of Bloomberg Government. And now let's get back to the markets and take a look at some stocks moving in pre-market trading here in the U.S. And I, of course, have to take a check on Didi because it was one of the big volatile movers from Friday. Fell 22 percent in the Friday session this morning. Traders not sure what to do. It was positive earlier by about 2 percent, but right now only up about three tenths of 1 percent in early hours as traders weigh that delisting from the U.S. relisting in Hong Kong. To the downside also is Moderna. A lot of confusion around the 
efficacy of vaccines against the Omicron variant. We heard from the company's president saying there's a real risk that the current vaccines will not be as effective. And as a result, that stock is down about 2.8%. And other movers to the downside include basically any equity that is tied to cryptocurrencies. Because as we were just hearing from Danny mm. Berger, it was a very, very volatile weekend for Bitcoin. Very much so to the downside. And you're seeing some stocks playing catch up to that weekend action this morning. One of them being Coinbase, the cryptocurrency exchange. It's down a little more than 6% before the bell, Anna. Yeah, maybe not quite the inflation hedge that some uh, crypto bulls think it could be. Now, coming up on the uh, on this program, we'll be talking about the markets, of course. Madison Fowler, J.P. Morgan Private Bank Global Strategist. Uh, we will get her perspective as we head towards the end of 2021. And Bitcoin's crushing weekend. Is there more pain ahead? We'll get further analysis there. Plus, the NFT debate. Why Kathy Wood is calling it the greatest thing to happen to artists. More ahead. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Matt Miller in Berlin with Kaylee Lyons in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Now, one of the really cool things about the start of this week, I was super pumped last night to get to work today because uh, you had this massive drop in yields. Kaylee was showing you earlier that uh, Treasuries came in 10 basis points in one session on Friday. They retraced that a little bit, but they're still down pretty severely. At the same time, hedge funds are positioned um, really long into the 20-year-plus ETF. And in Treasuries in general, hedge funds are making a bet um, that Jerome Powell is going to go through with the more hawkish pivot that he uh, showed in testimony in front of Congress and the Senate. Eddie Vandervault is here at Bloomberg M Live to talk about this discrepancy. Um, Eddie, how does this work itself out? Look, I, I have a lot of sympathy with the hedge funds going into this because clearly, you know, they, they didn't have any uh, foresight of the Omicron variant and the fallout from that. And I think that is what has been the dominant force in markets over the last week. Uh, and that's not going to change at the, this point in time. So it's a really hard one for them to call, I think. Um, but, you know, you've got to be you've got to be quick on your feet. You've got to react to the market very quickly as things change. Eddie, good morning. How much do you think what we're seeing in Treasuries at the moment is an assessment by investors that perhaps we're heading for a policy mistake from the Fed, that hikes in the shorter term are going to weigh on the economy in the more medium to long term, and that's, and that's why we're seeing the flattening? Does that explain what's going on? Yeah, I think so. I think there's, there, there, is a, there is a risk here. I mean, you know, we, we, it's amazing that we are even talking about inversion at this point where, where we're assuming to be so early in, a, in an economic cycle, presuming that the, uh, the coronavirus reset the cycle. Now, you know, I think, I think that the market is worried about this. They know that the Fed, all of the noises that we're getting from the Fed is now about inflation and about tighter policy. But, you know, what does that do for the longer term? And I think that is what we're seeing playing out here, that, that the market is saying, listen, listen they may do this, mm -hmm. but it might be a mistake. Well, we've seen turmoil in risk assets as well, Eddie, and that includes Bitcoin. Is Bitcoin a leading indicator for sentiment at this point or a lagging one? Oh, very good question. I, you know, I definitely over the weekends in general terms, I look at Bitcoin when I want to see where I think the Nasdaq is going to open on Monday, because it's a <laughs> very good indicator of uh, where tech stocks are going to be on Monday. It's better than many others that you could get out there. But I think Bitcoin had resisted the pull of um, tech in the last week a little bit, and it was only it was it. It's only starting to gather momentum now. So I think at this point, mm. I'd say Bitcoin is a little bit of a lagging indicator just at this particular okay. moment. That's really interesting, linking Bitcoin with tech stocks. Yeah, Nasdaq futures down this morning, despite the fact it was heavy Nasdaq selling that really weighed on Wall Street on Friday. So not expecting that to lead the rebound charge. Eddie, thank you very much. Eddie from the Markets Live team. And remember, you can get further market analysis from the Markets Live team. MLIV Go, that is the function to use in your terminal. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines in New York with Anna Edwards in London and Matt Miller in Berlin. Now let's get the first word news. And the president of Moderna says there's a real chance that existing coronavirus vaccines will be less effective against Omicron. Stephen Hodge told ABC that a 50% drop in effectiveness would require a reboot of existing shots. Still, he said it's too early to tell. The U.S. reportedly will declare a diplomatic boycott of the Beijing Winter Olympics. According to CNN, the decision not to send any U.S. officials to the Games in February will be announced this week. The move would be largely symbolic, as few U.S. officials are likely to visit China anyway due to strict quarantine rules and clashes over human rights. And the U.K. will push the U.S. to remove trump era tariffs on British steel and aluminum. The tariffs are a headache for Prime Minister Boris Johnson, who said that improved trade relations with the U.S. would be a major benefit of leaving the E.U. The U.K. Trade Secretary and U.S. Commerce Secretary will meet on Tuesday. Coming up, we'll get back to the markets with Madison Fowler, J.P. Morgan Private Bank, Global Strategist. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in Berlin and Kaylee Lines in New York. And Matt, European equity markets seemed as if they were really trying to bounce this morning. I'm not entirely sure our hearts were totally in it, though. Every time we hear an expert view on the Omicron uh, variant, the first line is often comforting and then the second line is followed up with, you know, but it's still too early to say. <laughs> and there's still a sense that that hangs over I markets. Mean... I think you, you got to say that, but everyone that we hear from starts off by saying it looks less <laughs> severe in terms of the health issues. So far. And of course, we got to wait till the data comes in so far. Of course, you could say that for the next 20 years. The point <laughs> is the market doesn't seem that freaked out about the Omicron variant. It looked like the market really wanted to sell, wanted to use any excuse last week to sell. Remember on, I think it was Tuesday, we got a headline that California yeah. had its first case of Omicron when everyone who was thinking about it knew that there were already dozens, if not hundreds mm. or even thousands of cases in the U.S. So the market is just using any excuse it can to get rid yeah. of risk assets, and that is the concern. Surprised by the unsurprising and get rid of risk assets and get rid of things that maybe have done really well and have mm -hmm. uh, maybe raised a few questions about being overvalued. Kaylee, and I'm thinking here about tech names, looking at Nasdaq futures. They were the heart of the selling on Friday and they're certainly not the heart of any rebound this morning. Yeah, once again, lagging in futures trading this morning. And I would argue it's not just about the Omicron variant that the market is trying to digest. It is also this all of a sudden hawkish Federal Reserve and the idea that the Fed may taper more quickly, normalize policy more quickly, tightening maybe coming sooner than the market previous previously anticipated and that could be weighing on risk as well and we certainly have seen things deteriorate over the last hour or so in Europe the stock 600 now up only by about a quarter of a percent and here in the U.S. futures are actually now flat when it comes to S&P e-minis actually just fractionally down by a little bit uh, less than two points in Nasdaq 100 futures as Anna has been saying also in negative territory so we could see some continued losses from Friday after that jobs report and of course after that jobs report we saw that monster bid into treasuries Matt and I have both been touching on this throughout the show 10 basis points lower in one day alone. We're retracing some of that this morning, though, up about four basis points on the U.S. 10-year yield to 138.51. And then, of course, Bitcoin hit with some heavy selling over the weekend. That is continuing this morning, down 3.6 percent, trading just over $47,000. And no surprise with that move in Bitcoin, basically any stock tied to cryptocurrencies is lower in pre-market trading here in the U.S. That includes Riot Blockchain, Marathon Digital, each down in the ballpark of 12 percent, and the likes of MicroStrategy and BitDigital under pressure as well, down between 6 and 8 percent each. Matt. Yeah, so crypto stocks down, uh, meme stocks down. The Bitcoin uh, handle of four is pretty amazing, considering last week we were looking at five and before that six, almost $70,000 it had been worth at its high. And it looks like retail investors are liquidating Bitcoin as their retail bets, as their meme stock bets fall. I've got a Goldman Sachs retail favorites basket here. Our radio listeners, uh, I'll welcome you to uh, the program again, London DAB, glad you're tuned in. What I'm showing here is just basically a bar chart. Goldman Sachs retail favorites getting crushed last week. As the S&P kind of rebounds a little bit, still not making up what it lost on uh, the Friday after Thanksgiving, but what it looks like is 
retailers who were uh, following very strictly the buy the dip strategy got burned so hard that they had to liquidate other positions. Madison Fowler joins us, Vice President and Global Market Strategist at JP Morgan Private Bank out of London to talk about what we're seeing here. And Madison, typically we've relied on these retail investors to bail us out. They buy the dip, the pajama uh, traders overnight bring us back after any drops. Is that going to continue? So what I think what we're seeing right now is that a lot of the speculative stuff is really being hurt in the face of the uncertainties that we're experiencing right now. Of course, Omicron variant is one key reason for that. The accelerated timeline for a Federal Reserve um, tapering also lays into that. And so I think those speculative areas of the market that may have felt a little bit frothy are really coming undone. And so when we look forward to how to orient ourselves around that, I do think it's incredibly um, important, especially as we transition to this mid-cycle environment and become more entrenched in this mid-cycle environment to really focus in on those quality areas of the market. And for us, that means really being balanced between both cyclical mm -hmm. and growth areas of the market. I do think cyclicality can certainly still work as, as we see ongoing economic reopening, as we see automation hit areas like, like the, the industrial sector, or we see interest rates rise like financials. But I would really stress that focusing on quality rather than on those speculative assets, I think, is really, really key as we move forward in this cycle. Good morning to you, Madison. So focus on quality uh, rather than the more speculative areas. We talk a lot about the pivot towards more hawkish policy that we've seen from the Fed. And, uh, and certainly that seems to be something that's gripped the markets recently. How much of that is, a, it, how much is that higher, higher rates narrative? How much is that a threat to uh, some of the tech names, for example? They seem to be the ones that feel it the hardest. We certainly saw that on Friday. Uh, and yet we don't actually see yields, certainly the 10-year year horizon, still down at 1.38%. How much of a threat do you think is the higher yield environment to some of those high-growth uh, tech names? Sure. So just to, to, to go off with Fed tapering, I think that there's a few important distinctions to make. Um, firstly, the, the Fed is really starting to taper given the confidence that's, that it's seeing in the economic backdrop. So the, the, the scale of asset purchases that the Fed had been making compared to a year ago just are no longer needed due to the fact that the economy is on much more stable footing. Um, and as it relates to, to tech names, I think it's also really important to make the distinction that tapering does not equal rate hikes. So Fed Chair Powell, for instance, has been really clear that um, tapering and rate hikes are very distinct policy tools. So even as we see a, a, a possibly accelerated taper timeline as we head into this December policy meeting, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, we're going to see an accelerated rate hike um, regime as well. And then the last thing I'd really point out on interest rates, um, real rates are still incredibly low. And so that really gives us confidence that even um, as the Fed does eventually employ on this uh, rate hiking cycle, even if the market does mm -hmm. get the two Fed rate hikes that it's currently currently telegraphing, the economy does seem very well um, able to handle those those higher interest rate hikes mm. give, and really wouldn't meet that friction zone that would disincentivize investment from businesses and consumers. OK, so you think that maybe the, the Fed can thread that needle. It's a complicated one. So markets pricing in maybe two, as you say, hikes next year. How do company balance sheets look then, Madison? Uh, how able are they to withstand that kind of tightening? Of course, coming off really low levels historically. Sure. So I think looking forward into this, this next economic cycle, corporates are really well positioned. We see corporations have incredibly strong balance sheets, very flush with cash and able to employ strong buybacks and dividends to, to return to shareholders. We're also looking at a really strong corporate earnings backdrop. Um, just over the course of this last year, it looks like earnings growth is going to come in around 45 percent um, for the S&P 500. Looking ahead into next year, we're expecting something around 15 percent earnings growth. And what I would say is that that's, I think, a really balanced acknowledgement of, of um, wh where we're going from here. So it's, it's very likely that earnings growth decelerates a little bit from that, you know, really strong, rampant pace that we've seen, which is why we're looking at more mid-teens earnings growth into next year. And I would say that that's going to be primarily driven by revenue growth. And in line mm. with the moderating pace that we're seeing, we're looking at really flat to just slightly higher margins. And so with all that said, I think that it's, it's really compelling that we can still see strength from, from corporates and strength in those corporate balance sheets to really carry stock markets higher over the course of the next year. Even as policy on both the monetary and fiscal side gets decidedly less supportive in theory over the next year? 
Sure, and I, and I would stress um, res more restrictive policy certainly um, acts as a headwind to risk assets over the course of, of the near term, especially as markets really try to recalibrate those changes. But when we look back at prior, um, not only tapering cycles, but also um, prior instances where the Fed is, is hiking interest rates, we have seen resilience from risk assets. And I think that really then ties us back into where do you focus in those types of environments? And I, I, I don't mm. believe that everything is going to work as we move forward into this, this mid-cycle environment. And so it's going to be so incredibly important to be really selective with those quality companies, and particularly focusing on those companies that are providing the strong balance between both cyclicality and secular growth, okay. but particularly those that are rooted in innovation um, and ongoing megatrends. Madison, thanks very much. Madison Fowler, Vice President and Global Market Strategist at JP Morgan Private Bank. Worth pointing out that uh, US uh, futures have been falling over the last hour and uh, Nasdaq futures now firmly in negative territory. Uh, S&P futures fairly flat. Coming up on this program, crypto crush, something else that's been falling. Is there more pain to come after this weekend's losses on Bitcoin? More next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the principal room. Coming up later today, an exclusive interview with Freeport LNG CEO Michael Smith. That's at 10.30 a.m. in New York, 3.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines in New York with Anna Edwards in London and Matt Miller in Berlin. Well, Bitcoin crashed more than 20% over the weekend before level leveling off below the $50,000 level. The cryptocurrency has joined a route in some of the riskiest assets amid the emergence of the Omicron variant and a hawkish pivot from the Federal Reserve. Mike McGlone, Bloomberg Intelligence Commodity Strategist, joins us now from Miami, and he just published his cryptocurrency outlook for 2022. So, Mike, it's a painful couple of days for Bitcoin. Bitcoin, how high do you think prices go next year? Well, I think it can get up to 100,000 next year, Kaylee, but it looks like we're going to be more suffering first. Right now, basically, long risk assets, assets is fighting the Fed. And the Fed said they're taking away the punch bowl, and the stock market's starting to correct. You really see that in bond yields. And so I think Bitcoin might get down to 40,000 for good support. It might probe there. Ethereum's testing 4,000 right now. But I think in the longer term, Bitcoin's going to come out ahead in this space. Supply is declining. Demand and adoption are on their way up. And it's going to move ahead. But right now, into the end of this year, hopefully the market will be OK. But we're into that risk-off period, and people are hitting their stops. It does look like the Fed, Jerome Powell's hawkish pivot has taken the froth out of these markets to some extent. It's not just Bitcoin that's gotten hit, but also retail favorites, which were, you know, let's face it, just kind of pumped up by um, Wall Street bets and not really companies that are profitable or um, look like they're going to be incredible growth companies unless you buy the DD on WSB. So what changes in that that allows retail investors to put money back into Bitcoin? Well, I think, Matt, we're right now we're at that stage where the, I mean, it's most spec, highly speculative assets on the planet. You can trade them 24-7. We all know that. So we're hitting those stops. I, I think it's going to find a better foundation. It's going to do what it did back in March, but not extreme. Back in March 2020, remember, Bitcoin bottom earlier, it took off the most, it was one of the most best produced um, performing assets in the aftermath, the Bloomberg Galaxy Crypto Index, Ethereum. That is, I think, what's going to happen again. I think we're seeing a major rotation out of equities into bonds, into more, you know, store value assets, gold and Bitcoin's in that bucket. It just got to purge some of those excesses first. So 40,000 good support, Ethereum holding 4,000 right now. But, th you know, a good example was, remember when Doge put a peak in April, the market went down? And we recently had Shibu Inu put in a peak right in early in November, and the market went down. So cryptos are a good early warning indicator for markets getting a little too speculative mm. and excessive. OK, I was going to ask you about that, Mike. Good morning to you, because I'm looking at a chart of Bitcoin's Hi, rising correlation with U.S. stocks. And I'm wondering what's leading here from what you're saying then is that it's the, the cryptos we should look to, not necessarily Bitcoin, though, for the for the leading indicator. 
Well, it's usually the rocket fuel assets that lead the most. I mean, I come from futures, and futures had all the speculation and margins, so they would lead. Now, in the big picture, it's cryptos, because it's just the biggest casino on the planet, and there's massive speculation, massive access, we know that. But, th but then there's the stalwarts. Crypto dollars are taking over the world. Dollarization is increasing through cryptos. And there's Bitcoin and Ethereum, and then there's 15,000 other ones, and that's the problem. We got to get those kind of purged a little bit, and we're going to go down to business where the world knows you got to have some Bitcoin in your portfolio and some Ethereum in there too. And dollarization's really taken off. I mean, um, people talk about stable coins, it's really a wrong name. It's crypto dollars are the dominant space. Mike, you, you didn't mean to, I'm sure, compare. Uh, Dogecoin and Shibu Inu with Bitcoin and Ether. I mean, you wouldn't put them really in the same uh, basket, would you? No, they're, Matt, Matt, they're examples of speculation machines. When they go down, the rest of the market follows. We have to purge those kind of things out. And then you come down to the real business of cryptos, and that is Bitcoin, Ethereum, crypto dollars. So they're just indications, they're speculation, they're gambling stocks or gambling tokens. They'll go away. And then we'll go back to the true business. But right now we're in that space. We've got to just purge some of the excesses and in all of markets. And, you know, Chairman Powell, he's pricking the bubble. It's just, you know, you're not supposed to fight the Fed. Yeah. OK, Mike, thank you. Yeah, thinking of, uh, of purging some of those smaller uh, uh, cryptos. I was seeing that Singapore was clamping down at the weekend on one that was set up, one coin that was set up literally to provide retirement funds for the uh, for the South Korean boy band BTS. But uh, the South Korean authorities taken against that one. Mike McGlone, thank you very much from Bloomberg Intelligence, joining us there from Miami, where I imagine it is a little warmer than it is here in London. Now at a meeting at a front, sorry, at a Bloomberg event on Friday in Miami, ARK's Kathy Wood and billionaire art investor uh, George Perez clashed over non-fungible tokens and art. Take a listen. On NFTs, you know, it's the greatest thing to happen to artists. It really is. You know, uh, there's a company called Async Art. When I first heard this, it was like an aha moment for me. This is, uh, is this is really going to, you know, stimulate and 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 cause some profound changes in the creator world. But artists, even with physical art, you know, turning it into digital. Um, NFTs, this is a property rights system. It's, it's, it's a very interesting phenomenon because we are moving into the digital world. No, I, and I understand that. And let me tell you, as an old timer and a lover of art and a passionate lover of art, I hope people don't lose coming to museums and experiencing the beauty of art on a personal basis. When I had to buy art, by phone, you know, and my apps, you know, and then now I finally get to come to look at museums and you look at great pieces of art, there is nothing like it. So, yes, I can understand how we will create new energies and, you know, but the beauty of art is always the personal experience. The of watching the art. So we have uh, a, an art gallery uh, with Signum, it's called Signum Arc. Uh, gallery, uh, and it's all uh, NFTs, digital art, and it is a thing of beauty as well. Kathy Wood there speaking with billionaire investor, I believe it's Jorge Perez. Yo hablo un poco espanol. They're speaking at a Bloomberg event in Miami on Friday. So talking a little bit about uh, NFTs and the new world of uh, digital art as well as crypto. And uh, I think, you know, there's a lot of people who are interested in this, but it's just so hard to get your head around what an NFT actually is. My mother, my 70 year old mother is trying to delve into the world of NFTs right now. I have no idea why, but I got a text from her asking me <laughs> if I knew of a solid marketplace for NFTs. Uh -huh. That was a little bit scary. That's a little bit scary, a sign of the times perhaps. Yeah, I saw that one of our colleagues, Joe Weisenthal, put out a, uh, a Thanksgiving how to cope with crypto and NFTs conversation, a sort of primer for everybody around the dining table. That might be useful for the holidays as well. I'll dig that out, send it, uh, send it your way. You can pass it on to your mum perhaps then, Matt. Now, coming up later today, Anne-Marie Trevelyan, UK Secretary of State for International Trade. That conversation at 4 p.m. in New York, 9 p.m. in London. They may talk about tariffs on steel. That's uh, a hot topic uh, across the Atlantic. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in Berlin and Kaylee Lines in New York. Tom Keane also joins us from New York, co-anchor of Bloomberg <coughs> Surveillance. And Tom, I know one thing that is on your mind this week and it's going to be the inflation print we get a little bit yeah. later on in the week from the United States. You know, we know there's a tight labour market now, tick. We also know there's a lot of inflation, tick, but will it be the highest since 1982? That's well, it's I'm a different wondering. kind of inflation. It does harken back to that. I would note, and I'm on a watch out here for what's happened in the last 60 minutes. In your hour, the markets have basically fallen out of bed. NASDAQ 100 south by 1.2%, and the VIX now well out over 30. So it's an active Monday. On the inflation front, in new Bloomberg technology here, this is really easy to bring up. If you've got a terminal in your car, you can bring this chart up easily, and it is a segmentation, a slicing and dicing of American inflation. And it brilliantly shows the explosion in goods prices and the explosion in energy prices. Goods in orange, energy in green. Yes, food's part of the story, but far more, it's about goods inflation and energy inflation getting us out in at that 6% level. Mm. It's, it's amazing that we have hit such a high level, Tom, but we're still so far away from, you know, the real inflation that a lot of us uh, still remember from the 70s and 80s. We don't, we don't expect any time to get near double-digit inflation or certainly not rates, right? I mean, we're not even close when it comes to the rates situation. Well, don't tell China. I noticed 22% is a Chinese rate uh, on dollar bonds this morning, part of their challenges. But I don't, I don't see that, Matt. I, there's a raging debate here of the character of this inflation. Uh, you know, you interview to interview, people change. But as Paul Krugman has pointed out, the laureate, is it 1947 inflation? Is it the kind of inflation that we saw in the 70s and a wide body of people go, maybe not. Mm -hmm. All right, Tom, thanks so much for joining us. Tom Keene there, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, talking to us about inflation. I'm actually watching, uh, waiting for the CPI data to come out on, uh, on Friday. I was reading yesterday Bloomberg's forecast uh, from Bloomberg Intelligence that will hit the highest level since 1982, which first, of course, immediately sent me to my uh, Apple Music to make a playlist. I'm putting in, you know, all of the John Cougar Mellencamp hits. A little story about Jack and Diane was 1982, but also uh, uh, Ebony and Ivory, which is a favorite of mine. Eye of the Tiger. And so then I realized on, it's Eileen, not just about maybe? music. Dexy's Midnight Runners. Sorry? <laughs> come uh, on, Dexy's, Eileen, makes the think, list perhaps. I'm not sure if that was the same year, oh, physical by Olivia that one Newton in. John. Uh, what I realized is um, also an incredible film. 1982 was a year I cried in the cinema when I watched E.T. This was a, an experience shared by many, I imagine. I'm going to be watching, uh, I'm not sure how to segue from, uh, from, uh, from E.T. into the Bank of England conversation, but I'm going to be watching this, the speech by Deputy Governor Ben Bo uh, Broadbent a little bit later on. Bloomberg Economics saying he may hold the balance of power as we go into a really important meeting for the Bank of England in December. We heard from Michael Saunders on Friday. He was cautious around Omicron. Will Broadbent be cautious around Omicron as well? And will that cause the market to unwind some of its rate hike bets here in the UK. More Bloom Bloomberg surveillance is ahead. We'll hear from Brian Levitt of Invesco and Sarah House of uh, Wells Fargo, amongst many others. This is Bloomberg.